My name's uh, Aaron Glenn. Uh, I'm here to talk about P4. I've given a couple of talks about it uh, previously in a few other events. Um, this one, I'm, I'm hoping to focus a little bit more on the applicability of it, why people should care. Um, perhaps some of you uh, out there in the audience uh, have heard of it, maybe uh, didn't quite get the full uh, appreciation or understanding of it. Um, hopefully, this presentation uh, answers a few of those questions. Uh, if you're into that sort of thing, I'm on Twitter as Network Service. I'm also on Mastodon, run a small BSD.network instance there, along with Peter Hessler, an open BGPD uh, committer. Um, yeah, thank you all for attending, and uh, let's start. So first and foremost, uh, software-defined networking, SDN. I, I get a lot of uh, quips that you know SDN stands for still does nothing. And I can understand why uh, OpenFlow, when it became kind of the, uh, the, the, the term for, for SDN, uh, it soured a lot of people's opinions uh, on SDN. And in my opinion, what happened there was the original goal of separating the control plane from the data plane, it's a good goal. That, that disaggregation. But what happened with OpenFlow as it matured and, and moved on, it, it didn't keep the idea of an open and consistent API. So not only was it inflexible, you only in each revision 1.0, 1 1.1, 1 1.3, 1 1.5, you, you had a fixed set of protocols that you understood, but it also left a lot of room for vendors to implement their own extensions, like the Nasira VMware extensions. Or it also allowed vendors to only implement a subset of, say, OpenFlow 1.3 or 1.5. And understandably, a lot of operators and, and, and network designers soured to it. And, you know, SDN really kind of uh, lost some of its luster. Well, in order to fix those kinds of deficiencies and move past to a, a more, uh, a better idea of software-defined networking, some of the original uh, Stanford uh, uh, researchers uh, came together and created something called P4. And that stands for Programming Protocol Independent Packet Processors. So you can kind of see where I'm getting the uh, alliteration from. It's uh, right there in the name, so I try to keep it going. Um, Programming protocol independent packet processors is, is kind of exactly what it says on the tin. It's a language that allows you to represent protocols uh, and process packets uh, without any of the structured uh, fixedness of OpenFlow. Now, before I go too far into P4, uh, for some of you that may be familiar with it or have heard of it before, uh, there's a couple of unfortunate common misconceptions. So I just want to get them out of the way right here, right now. P4 is not a general purpose language. You wouldn't write a BGP or OSPF implementation into it. Uh, it's specifically designed to be both computation and memory consumption bounded. You can't make a giant uh, a program out of it. Uh, P4 is not only for barefoot Tofino switches, if you're familiar with it, uh, which is the first hardware switching ASIC that natively supports P4. Um, of course, Barefoot is a large proponent of, of P4 and, and a major supporter of the P4 association. Uh, P4 is not specific to just Barefoot Tofino ASICs. Uh, and the last one is, ah, this is OpenFlow 2.0. It isn't. And hopefully by the end of this uh, presentation, you'll have an understanding why uh, OpenFlow 2.0 is just completely wrong. So what is P4, since we've kind of discussed what it's not? It is a domain-specific language for, again, programming protocol-independent packet processors. How does it achieve that? Well, P4 is specifically designed to be target-independent. So instead of worrying about what is actually processing the packets, what's forwarding them, what the underlying hardware is, P4 doesn't care. There's nothing in there that tells you uh, this is uh, ASIC or this is uh, a network card or something else. It's protocol independent. So your program defines what protocol uh, you're, you're processing for, uh, whether that be packet headers or the processing logic with what you do for those packet headers. So an example that I like to use is you could implement your own artisanal MPLS or your artisanal GRE tunneling program. 
what P4 specifies is a forwarding behavior. And one of the neat, powerful things about this is being able to reconfigure a P4 device. So once you've deployed a Tofino switch or deployed a SmartNIC uh, that runs a P4 program, you can redeploy it. You can completely change it. It can go from a provider edge uh, router to a top of rack switch or a leaf to a spine. Uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, so Aaron, a question here then. Go ahead. Uh, Go back to that slide. Sure. You, you said target independent. So there must be some kind of an abstraction layer between P4 and underlying hardware then, because not all under, underlying hardware has the same capabilities, can do all the same things. So what's in the middle? So what's in the middle is a compiler. And, and we'll get a bit into uh, later on in, a, in I think, uh, four or five more slides. We'll get into the real meat of it. but. What happens is in order to fully uh, uh, deploy a P4 program on specific kind of hardware, the hardware vendor, or in, in P4 parlance, the target, the architecture that you are writing your, or running your program on, they provide a compiler that then uh, puts in that middleware that, that, that translates your program into how it will be run and how it'll be organized on, on the target that you're, you're running for. Got it. Okay. So the, the, the P4 language itself is independent. It doesn't know anything about it, but the vendor that's giving you a P4 development environment, a compiler for the target that you're going for, that's where that magic happens. It's just like old school, any programming language really, only the magic is it's an ASIC now instead of an x86 or some kind of a general purpose CPU. Yeah. Right. Uh, and as we'll see later in, in there, it can be an ASIC, an FPGA, a network interface card, or some real wild stuff that we'll, we'll get into. So P4 as a language, where, where did this come from and, and what's the, kind of the mental model heel here? Um, if you're familiar with data planes uh, in, in some way, there's really uh, some basic uh, uh, functions that happen here. And, and P4 tries to model that uh, to the best of its ability. And I, I think it does pretty well. So you have a packet that comes in on an interface. And the first thing you want to do is parse that. Right, uh, and, and you want to know uh, Ethernet, VLAN tags, MPLS labels, et cetera, et cetera. You want to parse that. So P4 gives you uh, a, a, um, a language in order to uh, parse different headers. It's a finite state machine. That's what the little circles and, and arrows are there for. So I write a parser that can then parse out uh, values from however deep uh, the headers may go. And, and that's a target dependent thing. Uh, obviously your ASIC won't necessarily handle uh, 20 or 30 uh, uh, headers deep, but P4 can theoretically let you go uh, as, as enclosed or as deep uh, as you might want to or as your target allows. Now, once I'm done parsing it, I, I need to do something with that. So the next phase of it is max action tables. So uh, I parse and I have values. Those values match somewhere in a table, and when they do match, I I, I do some kind of action on it. Uh, the example I always go to is uh, decrementing the TTL field, uh, field in an ICMP packet. Um, if it's uh, an ICMP packet, after I've parsed it, I match that it's ICMP, I have a small control statement that says the TTL is now minus one, and then I move on to a buffer, and then I deparse it. And this is just a, a small example. We'll give a, a larger pipeline uh, in another slide. But Aaron, actually that example was, um kind of illustrative of a use case for P4. This is granular. We're, you're going down deep under the hood. You're messing with very detailed elements of network traffic here. This isn't a policy engine. This is this is much more deep than that. This, this So P4, the language itself, doesn't give you the abstraction to create a packet. It is specifically only for modifying packets uh, in the idea that a packet comes from an ingress port and then you can do stuff on it. P4 doesn't give you an abstraction to create a packet out of thin air. However, a lot of uh, Tofino specifically, but a lot of uh, P4 enabled uh, uh, devices allow that functionality to create packets from a P4 definition. But yes, to, to your statement, this is what we're doing. You're implementing or you're writing uh, uh, anything that you would find in a packet. I can represent anything that's a packet, I can represent in P4. I can represent the headers not the payload, right? This is an application 
Uh, this isn't layer seven or HTTP stuff. This is basically a, a layer two to layer four, TCP, UDP. That's about as far as you want to go uh, with P4 as it stands today. But yes, you are getting very, very low level. You're getting right to the meat and bones uh, of a packet. And that gives you a lot of power. Uh, I know a lot of questions that I get uh, after speaking with people about P4 that go, well, that sounds all well and good, but you know, I don't have an artisanal MPLS stack that, that I want to uh, uh, implement. And, and I'm just fine with VLANs and VXLAN and, and GRE. Uh, can P4 really uh, uh, represent everything that I use currently in my network or might use in a year or two or three or whatever's down the road? And I like to pull up this, the, this paper um, called DC.P4, Programming the Forwarding Plane of a Data Center. And in the paper, they go into their trials and tribulations of representing all of the protocols and functionality that you might find in a, a very featureful data center switch or data center network. And then they represent it in P4. And as you can see here, it goes from as simple as, as virtual LANs, uh, VLANs, or, or spanning tree PDUs to maybe something as exotic as uh, NVGRE or, or ER span. And they're able to represent and more accurately program these protocols in P4 with not a lot of lines of code. So the other question I get from people are, okay, well, P4 lets me do something that people have been doing since forever. I mean, network devices have always been programmable in some sense. That's how we got VXLAN. That's how we get new protocols. You have to be able to program things. So why would I want to learn a domain specific language and why would I want to change uh, the development uh, style of things? Well, a good example that I like to come up with uh, is Pisces. Now, again, this is a academic research uh, uh, paper, not necessarily something that was uh, rolled out into production, but for the demonstrative purposes here, they took Open vSwitch and they calculated the lines of code, uh, the complexity, uh, using lines of codes as a, a measurement for complexity uh, to represent um, certain protocols, uh, certain things that Open vSwitch does. And then they went and implemented it in P4. And Pisces in this paper is kind of a compiler that lets you take a P4 program and compile it to the OVS uh, API, the Open vSwitch API. And the example here is, okay, to implement uh, tunnel OEM flags or connection labels, I had to change hundreds of lines and tens of files, whereas in P4 it's one file and four, five, six lines. So it's a lot easier to reason about these protocols, not to mention implement them. And not to beat a dead horse too far, but um, here's an example of Onos, uh, who supports OFDPA, uh, something that is not academic, something that is out there in, in production networks right now and quite sizable ones. And uh, Onos has a, a small group called a P4 Brigade, basically um, a group led by uh, Carmelo uh, Castron, I hope I'm remembering his name correctly, apologies if not, but uh, they're implementing P4 and P4 runtime, uh, a thing we'll get to in a couple slides here, uh, deeply and quickly in Onos. And uh, an excellent example that they give here is doing some of the same thing in OFDPA uh, versus implementing it in, in P4 and including the notoriously verbose Java uh, implementation to understand P4 is a third the size. So you're not dealing with as much code. Um, and I would like to think, and though sometimes that doesn't happen in reality, but with less code uh, becomes less bugs. At least there's less things to reason about and hopefully more people can understand what's actually going on. All right, so let's talk about P4 programs and, and what they actually look like. What, what happens when you're actually going into P4? Uh, the latest version of P4 is called P4.16, uh, and that's the only one I'll, I'll focus on. Uh, maybe one or two of you are familiar with P4.14. There are some appreciable differences, but for the purposes of our discussion, uh, we, we won't spend any time on that. So I borrowed a slide here from the ONF to uh, give a more complete example of what a P4 uh, pipeline looks like. So we have our circles and arrows, that's our, our finite state machine parsers. Then we have uh, any number of match action tables in order to do actions on the packet, whether that be uh, manipulate them or add a header or remove a header or change a part of a header. Uh, once that ingress pipeline, that first pipeline is done, it gets queued uh, 
And then in the middle here, you'll see uh, packet queuing, replication, and scheduling. As it stands right now, P4 doesn't let you uh, represent those things. It is not a programmable aspect uh, in P4. So those are fixed functions. Now, what happens, you need to interact with those things, right? So what P4 does is splits up your program, or in this case, my program, uh, p 4 and then it defines an architecture. Uh, so back to Ethan's question of, well, what happens when I'm, I'm, I'm where's the magic for, for an ASIC or an FPGA or something like that? You have a definition of the architecture. So I can run my, my program.p4. I include architecture.p4, the, the target that I want to run my, my program on. And that gives me a interface for what is available on the target that I'm, I'm trying to run my program on. So it will give me, uh, uh, things like, um, uh, interfaces for uh, hashing, let's say, CRC16, CRC32. That's not something you implement in P4, but that's something you want to call when you are creating a packet or, or doing some kind of uh, manipulation on a packet. So what happens is you have an architecture that says, yes, on this architecture, we have hardware or we have a C program, we have a subroutine, we have something outside of the P4, outside of the data plane that will do a CRC32 calculation for you you define that in the architecture.p4 file. That tells you where you're actually running, uh, running the stuff. So here I'm gonna give an example of the main components of a P4 program, just to really drive it, drive it home here. In this case, the architecture is what we call the V1 model, the first, first model. This is an open source, uh, generally accepted uh, abstraction of what any kind of packet switch does whether it be your tiny little Netgear or your big fancy Cisco. In this case, we start off with a parser. We want to verify that there were no corruptions, so we have a small checksum, uh, small checksum uh, function. Uh, then we go into our egress pipeline, where we start doing things based on what we parsed, based on the headers of the file, uh, based on the headers of the packets. Uh, once we're done there, we want to send it out, so we go to egress, where we have another opportunity to do any number of of manipulations or changes based on what may have happened in the ingress part. Then once we're all done, we need to compute the new checksums before we send it out. And once we've computed all those checksums, we deparse it. We reassemble this new packet and we hand it off to the physical layer, to the hardware, to send it off uh, onto uh, a new interface. And so this is what the basic structure of any P4 program will, will basically boil down to. Parsing, most likely some checksums, your ingress, your egress, compute your checksums if you're doing checksums, which you most likely are, and then a D parser. And you have control over every part of that pipeline. You get to insert your own code into each one of those and control those aspects of it. But where all of these things are happening, once that P4 program is compiled, all of this functionality is living on the ASIC and the ASIC within its capabilities and its pipelines are, are doing all of these things, so it's happening at wire speed. It's not like we're punting off to a control or you know a control plane CPU or something in the box, right? Nope, not at all. Yes. So uh, in this for a P4 target, what happens is it's it's installed uh, in an ASIC, in this case a, a Tofino, let's say, uh, and it does this at wire rate. It doesn't punt anything to any any control plane or any other kind of CPU or generic process. Uh, the P4 target is doing this. At, at wire speed. Um, and for things that aren't ASICs, that really comes down to your vendor's compiler. How good is the compiler? So for things that aren't ASICs, like FPGAs or smart network interface cards uh, or, or uh, software-based things like eBPF or XDP, which we'll get into, um, that comes down to your compiler. But for something like Tofino uh, with Barefoot, which gives you a compiler, if it compiles, if your P4 program compiles without errors, and it, it will get installed to the ASIC, and it will run at wire speed. Yeah. So the fastest Tofino right now is 6.4 terab 6.5 terabits per second. So if you can represent it in P4 and it will compile, you'll run it at 6.5 terabits per second. So just to just to restate what you've got here, um, the the packet's going to flow in. We're going to verify that the packet we've got is valid, something that we can act on. 
we have ingress manipulations, uh, things that we want to do on the way in, and then maybe we want to do something to it on the way out. So egress manipulations. Then we've changed the packet, so we got to redo the checksum. We're going to recompute that, and then we're going to send it on its way. Is that what we got here? That's exactly it. Okay. Got it. And so just to give you a little taste of what actual P4 code looks like, and of course, uh, I could spend a lot of time uh, giving you a tutorial of the language, but I kind of just want to whet your appetite, so to speak, about P4, so I'll, I'll save that. But here's an example of what the code looks like. And if you're familiar with any kind of development or, or software development, uh, it looks kind of like C. Uh, the syntax and grammar is certainly uh, uh, informed and inspired by C. But again, as a domain-specific language and not one that it does generic computing, uh, you're not worried about memory allocations or freeing up things or, or infinite loops or any kind of uh, non-deterministic behavior. Uh, P4 as a language is very, very small. I believe there's only about 40, 45 keywords in it. So there really isn't even that much to learn as far as syntax or grammar goes. But to uh, go back and, and, and show some code that refers to the previous diagram, here I have my, my core. I have the model that I'm going after, so I would include this. If, uh, if I was writing for uh, a Tofino, I might include barefoot Tofino.p4, and that would be the architecture that I'm writing for. Now, I want to be able to declare what it is I'm interested in, so I have these structures that are, uh, represent an IP4 address, or represent Ethernet headers, or MPLS labels, or TCP and UDP, uh, TCP flags, or, or UDP fields, or things like that. And then I have uh, inside there a parser, and a parser is the only place in P4 where you can have a loop. It's a finite state machine, and a parser basically says, I will go through all of this logic, and by the end of all of this logic in this finite state machine, I either accept it, and I have the values parsed, or I bail out and it didn't work. It will never go to any other state. It's either accept or fail. That's the only part in P4 where you can have a loop, and it only can end up in two places. And this is powerful enough to be able to parse any kind of packet with any kind of header you could imagine. If your protocol can be represented in a packet form, P4 can represent it in, 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 the, in the code. So it's not necessarily Ethernet or IP or MPLS. You could represent OTN. Uh, if it's a packet, you can represent it, guaranteed. So after the parser, we have our control statements. And in order to keep it short, uh, here we have uh, uh, the ingress part of it. Of course, you could also have the egress and, and other parts, the checksum. But for brevity here, we have the control flow. And in this case, we have uh, my egress. And uh, we set up our tables. Um, so in this one, we have the longest prefix match, IPv4 uh, LPM, and we create a table structure where if we remove, let's say, from our header parsers in IPv4, we grab the IP address, uh, and now I want to uh, match that IP address in a standard uh, longest prefix match lookup. This is where I would make that table. This is where that would happen. And when I do have a match, I apply some kind of control to it. Uh, in this case, maybe I do a lookup in another table uh, for basic routing and find uh, the next top MAC address. And I recreate the, the packet, I deparse it, and I send it out on its way. So this is a real terse, but hopefully um, illuminating example of what P4 the language looks like. And again, what a typical, not necessarily trivial, but a, a, a typical program uh, would look like in, in P4. It's interesting. It highlights uh, you know, one example that's just fresh in my mind because of some recent presentations I've seen. Uh, maybe not the code as such, but um, SRV6. I know I can do SRV6 on Tofino. Well, yeah, there's a lot of actions that have to be taken on that packet as it flows through. Uh, pointers to be changed and uh, destination ad IP address has got to be changed as it flows through each segment. And it, now it's very evident exactly how you would, could write a P. It wouldn't even be hard, I don't think, from what you've been showing. It's not. And in fact, uh, to SRV6 specifically, uh, there are actually two open source implementations of SRV6, of course, of differing completeness and IETF draft features included. But there are two SRV6 P4 implementations that you can get on GitHub right now and clone. Uh, 
uh, that are developed uh, incidentally by um, a couple of Japanese developers that I follow on Twitter. Um, and SRV6 is, 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 was particularly big in Japan and in Asia and it seemed to have uh, proverbially crossed the pond over, but uh, in mobile networks. And to just give you an example, a taste, there'll be a few more examples of the powerfulness of this in production, but they implemented SE, S, SRV6 in P4. It's less than a thousand lines of code, all total, and included in that is a bunch of uh, evolved packet core LTE packet gateway functions. So as we might call virtual network functions. So inside those P4 programs, they have SRV6, they have a generic tunneling protocol, which is something that LTE EPC uses, and a bunch of other stuff. It's less than 2,000 lines of P4 code. The SRV6 part is open source. You can get it on GitHub right now, and it runs on Tofino, fully line rate. It runs on uh, FPGAs, Name your dealer, Intel or Xilinx. Both of them have uh, uh, architectures, uh, targets, uh, compilers for, for that kind of stuff. And the neat part is it's open source. And uh, I'll, I'll try to speak a little bit more on that uh, towards the end and sort of my vision and, and excitement uh, towards P4. So how does that work? I write a P4 program and we have an architecture model, but all right, how does the rubber meet the road here? Well, these are all the uh, elements of a P4 environment that you need. You need your program, of course. Uh, if you're doing P4.16, which if you're new to it, that's what you'll be doing, uh, you need an architecture model, then you need a compiler, and then of course you need a control plane and a data plane. Well, who provides what? In this case, you, the operator, will write your program, or maybe you'll get it from someone else, but you provide the P4 program, and you bring your own control plane, uh, the idea of disaggregation and white, bo white box networking. But depending on what your P4 program is ultimately going to run on, that comes from your vendor. The architecture model needs to come from the vendor. The compiler needs to come from the vendor. And ultimately, what's running your data plane will be from your vendor. So in this case, you're still reliant on some other person. This isn't a, a, a free-for-all where you get to implement all of the things all by yourself without any kind of outside uh, uh, help. You need a vendor, and that vendor needs to provide you with high-quality architecture model to take full advantage of whatever hardware or, or old software underlying that's running the P4, executing the P4. And above all, and not to sound too much like the uh, infamous developers, 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 but in the P4 world, it really comes down to the compiler, the compiler, the compiler. That's where you're going to either make or break your P4 uh, uh, fun, your P4 savings, your P4 flexibility, your P4 performance. It all comes down to how sophisticated, uh, how well-developed, uh, how complete the compiler is. And so vendors have a way to differentiate themselves on, 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 on the compilers that they provide for, for their products. So enough so about just P4. To, sorry, oh, go ahead. Give some clarification on Does that mean then the compiler is essentially attached to the ASIC or whatever the underlying hardware is that I'm going to get from the vendor? Yes, exactly. So in this case, whenever you, if you are lucky enough or, or working with a Barefoot Tofino, um, Barefoot provides you, they call it P4 Studio now, it used to be called Capistrano. Uh, they provide you both a software development environment and they provide you a compiler. Um, it's conceivable that someone could write a different compiler for the Tofino uh, ASIC, I mean, technically, uh, but you have to have such a, a deep understanding of the underlying target that you're working with that it would be difficult. It's not like writing a, a CLang versus GCC for the Intel architecture or for ARM64 or something like that. Um, hopefully, there's more open source hardware, RISC-V, if you might be familiar with it, uh, that might change, but yes, in, in this regard, uh, whatever's running the P4, whatever's providing the data plane, whether it be hardware or software, the compiler comes from those people because it, it's so uh, uh, tightly integrated. Uh, so what are the chances term. then, if I've written a P4 program and I want to run it across, say, a barefoot switch and then something that's running an FPGA and a third device that's running a smart NIC, am I going to need to adjust the program based on the compiler, or can I write the programs that will run across all three? Sure. Uh, P4, especially P4.16, strives very hard uh, to not tie itself to any one hardware. I mean, that was a, a major goal of the language originally, and they kind of worked out, ironed out all of those uh, side things. Yes, 
And there's people doing that right now. I hesitate to say the famous Java line, write once, uh, run anywhere, because that's, that's not true, right? We, we, we've all been around the block long enough to know that that's not a, a real thing. But what happens is if you do need to make any changes, they're extremely minimal. And in fact, you can kind of abstract them even further. So I have my P4 program and I include the architecture model. And uh, theoretically, and in a lot of cases, I just swap out the architecture model, right? So I keep my underscore program dot P4 the same. And then uh, I have the barefoot architecture. Okay, and now I wanna run that SRV6 on an FPGA. I put in the, I include the FPGA and run that. And then if I wanna run it for EVPF, I include the EVPF uh, uh, architecture. Um, from what I've seen uh, in the limited production and limited uh, proof of concepts uh, that have gone out, that generally holds true. Uh, and in the cases where it doesn't, the modifications are extremely minor. I mean, we're talking maybe changing five or six lines in order to take advantage of, again, maybe a checksum or, or a hardware feature um, that doesn't neatly abstract. But yes, you, you can write it once and run it on very many places without having to change anything. Excellent. So Aaron, this is a good time to ask a question that came in from the audience. For someone who doesn't have sure. P4 hardware, P4 capable hardware, is there uh, an emulator or some, something like that so you can work on P4? Yes, so the P4 Association uh, has a GitHub, uh, github.com slash P4lang, uh, L-A-N-G, uh, and they create the, or they maintain the canical uh, P4 compiler, it's called P4C. Uh, it will compile to two different targets, two different backends. Uh, the first one is extended Berkeley packet filter, uh, eBPF in Linux. Uh, that has limited uh, uh, functionality. Uh, eBPF is more of a, a filtering uh, uh, target as opposed to a wild packet manipulation. The second one that closely emulates more of what a switch or what programmable hardware would be able to do is called the behavioral model, uh, BMV2. Uh, and what happens, there's a lot of tutorials, and one of my last slides uh, uh, recommends uh, two very good uh, tutorial groups that people can take, but a lot of those tutorials uh, focus exactly on that. So you don't necessarily need to have P4 hardware or anything like that. You can do a Git clone, you'll get the P4C, uh, P4 compiler, and you can write your P4 towards uh, the BMV2 uh, model and, and be able to do all kinds of stuff. There's a whole wealth of, of tutorials, and, and that'll be on uh, one of my slides coming up here soon. So we talk a lot about P4, but uh, how do we control it, right? Uh, how does it interface with the control plane? Uh, and then, so there's a second part of it called P4 runtime. Uh, it's protobuf based, if you're familiar with protopuf. Uh, if not, Google it. Um, it's P4, P4 runtime is program independent. So I have a consistent API to the control plane, regardless of what my P4 program is doing. That's really powerful. Uh, I can manipulate tables. I can change uh, values of certain things. I can't change the parser, but those match action tables, I can insert and change values. And that API with which to do it is consistent. So even if I change the underlying P4 program, my control plane API is independent and stays the same. Uh, the P4 runtime uh, API also allows you to do that reconfigurability in the field. Hey, all right, I deployed this P4 program. What's the interface to deploy a new one and change everything? P4 runtime uh, is it. Do we really need another control plane interface? I've heard so much about OpenFlow and maybe you have some familiarity with the SWIFT subtraction interface. Here's the compare and contrast. Uh, yes, OpenFlow and SAI and P4 runtime are target independent, but these other two are not protocol independent and they're not pipeline independent. And pipeline is basically a fancy word for what's happening in the data plane, what my P4 program is doing. So yes. We do need P4 runtime, as I uh, copied from this ONF uh, slide. What does P4 runtime look like? Well, I have my P4 so source code, and part of the compiler will generate these things called a P4 info file, and that's what creates the interface between what I've defined in my P4 program and the API uh, to modify or read values from those things. So as we'll get into the next slide, P4 info is where a lot of the interesting stuff happens for maybe your brownfield network or your fixed function switches, okay? Um, the P4 runtime uh, specification and all the P4 specifications are exceedingly easy to read. If you have any interest in this kind of stuff, I highly suggest going to p4.org, uh, clicking on specification specs and trying to read it. It's not as bad as any other specification you might have uh, 
felt like. It's really, really great. Uh, they're very, very readable, very, very to understand, especially if you're a network operator. But so this is just the reference architecture of what the P4 runtime control plane looks like. Now, I, I promised in my thing to talk about how P4 would work uh, in your fixed function network, your existing, your existing network out there. P4 runtime is a consistent control plane interface, and it gives you that interface whether the underlying hardware, or in this case, target, is actually programmable. So uh, you don't necessarily have to have the P4 source or even have a programmable ASIC in order to realize the advantage or the flexibility of P4 runtime. There's a project out of ONF called the Stratum Project, and this is something that Google is doing at scale along with other people in, in the foundation, uh, where they're managing their fixed function Broadcoms, uh, Trident 2s, Tomahawk 2s, et cetera, et cetera, alongside their programmable Tofinos with the same control plane, the same interface, to it. All you have to do is represent that fixed function ASIC in P4, which is something you can do. So, yeah, yep, there's that next slide from Google. This is the example. I have a logical representation of what I want to do, and these boxes are like uh, uh, access control lists or uh, a layer two uh, 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 Mac uh, arc table, or, or this larger one here might be your your forwarding information base or something like that. Now, my ASICs are different. Their pipelines are different. They're fixed in the silicon, so they're different in a physical manner, but logically they end up doing the same thing. Uh, so if I can represent that functionality logically in P4, I should be able to control them. And yes, you can. And that's what P4 info and P4 runtime does. Google is doing this. It's doing it at scale. This is not a pie in the sky uh, research thing. It's just there, there is a catch, though, where with a programmable ASIC, you have a lot more flexibility of what you might be able to do with a fixed function. You can only do certain things, but you could still use P4 to do those certain things. Exactly. And so, yes, uh, it, with this consistent interface, you're, of course, uh, constrained by the lowest common denominator. So in this case, it would uh, not to point out Broadcom, but, you know, your older Broadcom, your Brownfield uh, uh, ASICs and switches there. So. You might have heard that Juniper and Cisco are starting to support P4, and that might be a little confusing to certain people because they're going, well, I don't think Juniper is going to make a, a programmable hardware. Are they going to really let me rewrite the MPLS stack on a MX or something like that or a PTX? When, the, when these companies say we're going to support P4, what they really are getting at is that they're going to give you a P4 runtime interface. They're going to speak P4 but still have their own underlying proprietary uh, ASICs and, and software development kits to those ASICs. Um, P, uh, Juniper has a, a interface called the Abstract or Advanced Forwarding Interface, AFI. It's open source. They have a, a few things on GitHub about it. Um, but what they're looking to do is unify the control plane interface and allow you to bring your own third-party controllers, either on the device or centralized, and speak P4 runtime. Now, of course, even if underlying uh, functionality of these Juniper devices are written in P4, Juniper's not going to give up that intellectual property. Uh, they're not going to give you the P4 code to it, but they can give you the P4 info file. They can give you what you need for the P4 runtime interface because there's nothing proprietary in there, right? There's no uh, intellectual property. They're not giving up any secrets. And Cisco is doing pretty much the same thing. They have a thing called open forwarding abstraction uh, that's primarily, I believe, supported on iOS XR. Uh, and uh, I haven't seen too much actual open source, actual code, rubber meets the road kind of thing, but they've been talking about it. Uh, I know, and I know some things are happening uh, out there, and they're working with uh, P4 runtime and supporting it. So just to sum up, when someone like Cisco or Arista or Juniper says, hey, we're supporting P4, what they're really saying or what they're alluding to is that they're, they're, they have a control plane interface that will speak uh, in P4's dialect. Uh, and, and in this case, that's P4 runtime. P4 and P4 runtime aren't the end-all be-all. We haven't solved software-defined networking. They're a powerful building block. There's still some deficiencies in P4 and P4 runtime that you can't program and you can't represent. Uh, one of them, namely, is scheduling algorithms. That is a very active part of research and lots of discussion is happening in P4. I imagine probably in, in, in a year or 18 months, uh, there'll be a new uh, uh, standardization that will let you uh, represent scheduling algorithms and things like that. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there, but unfortunately we don't have the time. Uh, P4 is good as an intermediate representation. There's a lot of interesting research that's very applicable to network operators, especially at scale, where you have a higher level abstraction that then compiles down to P4. 
and one of my favorites is NetCat, uh, Clean Algebra with Tests. Uh, some of the papers aren't uh, very readable, especially for someone like me who's not a total math head, but Domino and NetCat uh, allow for a lot of interesting verification. You can verify properties of both your data plane and your control plane uh, when it's represented in these languages that then compile down into P4. I want to give one final example of just how powerful P4 is for some of the skeptics that are out there. There's a great paper called In-Network Computing, a Dumb Idea Whose Time Has Come. You can do neural networks inside the network. Imagine your Tofino top of rack switch or programmable ASIC running the neural network instead of on your Kubernetes cluster or on your generic uh, uh, CPU. I could do complex event processing. Uh, this is a, a real one that lets you come in and stream things like Kafka streams and manipulate them in the network on your switch, not on the servers behind it. Uh, the one that I'm most excited about, especially in this containerized world, is in-network coordination and consensus. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you use Etsy, D, is the control plane, and it's just a key value store that runs a consensus protocol amongst all the other Etsy, D ones. This NetChain paper uh, basically re-implements uh, a version of Paxos, runs it in five switches, and instead of going from, let's say, 20 million key value inserts and changes, you're doing it at line rate on these barefoot ASICs, and you're getting over 2 billion key value store reads, writes, and changes. It completely changes the game for things like container management or just really anything that uses a key value store with some kind of consensus. And this is all represented in P4 that runs on Tofino's today. So an incomplete list of targets. Right now, you can go out and find papers and some open source or some commercial uh, implementations uh, that support P4, eBPF and Express Data Path. Uh, you can find those uh, uh, on GitHub right now. Vector packet processing was something that didn't quite happen. Uh, both Xilinx, uh, Netcope, and a few other companies uh, provide P4 pipelines, uh, compilers for FPGAs. Of course, there's the Barefoot uh, Tofino ASIC. There's a great paper about taking a P4 program and compiling it for GPUs uh, with all of the things that, you know, the latency and memory access for all that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, a few other ones that aren't too applicable. And then Netronome makes a smart NIC uh, that is programmable that you might be familiar with. They have a full P416 uh, tool chain to support uh, programming their network interface cards. Um, Arista has a, a Tofino-based uh, platform, the 7170. Uh, it's very flexible. You can run different kinds of MPLS over GRE, MPLS over UDP. Uh, you can change that on the fly as you need it. One of the most exciting things about P4 is in-band telemetry, uh, and uh, naturally these data center switches uh, support that great. It doesn't eat up any control plane CPU. You get deep packet inspection, high volume, and all at line rate. And you can you know, punt 100 gigs worth of, of telemetry data out uh, to whatever hopefully can handle that kind of collection. Um, another example, Cisco has released uh, also a Tofino switch, the Nexus 3400 series. Um, they have two different profiles. This is just a generic one. You can then upgrade it later, later to a more routing heavy one where there's more space for layer three routes uh, and less features on the QoS and ACL, ACL type uh, things, a uh, completely different profile. Um, Tutorials that I suggest right now, there's one from uh, a Zurich Technical College that you can find there, P4-Learning. Excellent, 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 excellent. Great, great, great introductory. Uh, it really starts from basic understanding. You don't, if the idea of a, a pipeline and data plane is scaring you, don't be scared, start here. Uh, then there's the official P4 Association tutorials, also great, constantly being updated. Uh, if you want some sort of a higher level thing, you want to play around with with, with more of the control plane aspect of things. There's a P4 runtime tutorial from the Onos uh, 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 group uh, from ONF. They have hands-on exercises, VMs you can download and fire up in VirtualBox and start playing uh, as quickly as you can download the VMs. If you want some hardware to play with, but you're not ready to spend $5,000, $6,000 on a Tofino switch, I totally get it. You can get a Netronome Agilo CX uh, SmartNIC for less than $600 in quantities of one. Uh, there's a place called Colfax International. They'll sell you one, no problem. I think it's about $530. Uh, it comes with a license for all the software, and you can start developing things on Netronome. You can start uh, GitHub checking out SRV6 or PPPoE termination scripts uh, put up on GitHub and start running them on your Netronome uh, immediately. Uh, one last thing uh, is speaking to SRV6. Bell uh, is doing this in production. They're running uh, uh, basically the same SRV6 program implementation on a multitude 
of, of different uh, hardware. So they're running it on leaf switches, they're running it on servers, they're running it on spine switches, and in some cases, they're even running it on CPEs that are more powerful enough. This is something that's being done in production. This isn't just an academic exercise. Uh, large telcos with actual money are doing things with P4, uh, and in my opinion, very interesting things. Um, again, an example here, they have NICs, FPGAs, uh, li uh, leaf and spine switches, same, same SRV6 uh, P4 program running on three different, uh, three different targets. Uh, and yeah, that's all of my slides. Hopefully we have a minute or two left. Ooh, I went over, didn't Yeah, we, I got some questions to fire off for you, Aaron, that have come in. Um, Go right ahead. One, uh, one, you had a slide on this, but uh, you can elaborate. How does the P4 language relate to the SAI published by Microsoft? Sure. Uh, so in this case, SAI um, is, is more of a control plane uh, uh, interface, uh, an API, API um, in order to manipulate the, the software, the, the SDK that comes from Broadcom or Mellanox. The people that make those ASICs uh, have a binary blob uh, that presents uh, a different API depending on who they are. And the switch abstraction interface tries to abstract that away and give you a unified API so you can interact in the same fashion with Broadcom or Mellanox or Intel switches. Uh, P4 lets you program what's actually happening. When I say fixed function ASIC, that means all the functionality is burnt into the silicon. I can't change it, right? Uh, P4 uh, expects the target to be programmable. I can change that functionality. Uh, so really the, the closest correlation is P4 runtime and SAI. Those two uh, are, are actually adjacent, not so much the P4 language. All right. Uh, another question from Hamid, uh, what kind of scheduling algorithms can we write with P4 and uh, what, what parts are challenging and what are easier? And I, I saw your slide on that towards the end that this is a, a tough problem with lots of research ongoing. So there's a lot of research ongoing right now. P4 doesn't give you any way to influence queuing or scheduling. You just don't do it. Uh, you only get to manipulate uh, packets. You only get to read packets. You only get to Again, ma manipulate and change packets. You don't get to say, ah, okay, uh, I can tell it which egress port to go out to, but I can't tell it, okay, uh, this, this queue is first in, first out, or last in, first out. There's no way to represent that in P4 as it stands today. However, there is a lot of research going on right now uh, in order to bring that kind of functionality to P4. But when you write a P4 program today, whether it be on a Tofino or an FPGA or something like that, the architecture, the hardware itself, makes those definitions for you. And if it is programmable on the target that you're doing, that's a separate interface that the vendor gives you. You don't represent it in P4. And then one final question is about uh, relevance of P4 to the average network engineer. So back in the day, we had OpenFlow. A lot of people maybe didn't really need to get down to that level. P4 is the same question. Where are the typical use cases? How much does the average network engineer need to care about P4? Uh, I don't think today or even next year the average network operator or engineer really should concern themselves. Uh, you know, we only have so much bandwidth. Uh, P4 is not that interesting to you. Uh, my vision of P4 uh, in a programmable world is independent software vendors, a la carte protocols. Uh, as network operators, which I've been for over a decade, uh, you get a new image from, from the big vendors and it's uh, playing a game of whack-a-mole. Ah, well, we, we updated this, which created a new bug, and even though you don't use MPLS, it's affecting what you actually do use. Uh, being able to kind of mix and match and choose what you're running on your hardware not only gives you efficiency and consumption and, uh, and power consumption or, or uh, amount of utilization of the hardware that's available to you, but it also lets you pick and choose what you're running and not anything you don't want to run. Uh, so as a network operator, as a network engineer, I think it's interesting because you'll have a lot more control ultimately what you're getting from the vendors you purchase from. Hopefully you have more choice in vendors uh, and you have much more control over ultimately what's deployed in your network. Uh, 